This is Eero from Skepticism, and you are listening to the Thomas Eriksen podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the long, long-awaited new episode of uh, the Thomas Eriksson podcast. Episode 36 is around, and it only took about a half a year to get to here. The last episode was in July or so. Uh, the episode I did with uh, Eero over there in Finland. Yeah. Where does time go? Time flies. But hey, there's been plenty of shit going down and uh, lots, of, lots of stuff to do. So just for the heck of it, I will uh, do a short little roundup uh, regarding what's been going down since last time. The first real big thing that happened uh, in the world of Mork and uh, myself uh, was that we finally got to play the Wacken Open Air Festival in Germany after being put off for about a couple of years. Uh, as you all know, uh, due to the pandemic situation, what a fantastic experience. Uh, the festival is huge, uh, well organized, and uh, everything is taken care of. I don't know, We, I think we got the most out of the experience. And... Uh, I didn't even start counting how many people that uh, was standing in front of us that uh, evening. It uh, It's uh, for sure the biggest or the largest crowd we ever uh, performed in, f- in front of. So it was thousands. Uh, and I thank you so fucking much for uh, taking part of it. Uh, the show was even uh, uh, taped on video. So uh, you are... I think you're able to see the the complete show at uh, vakken.com or something. I know that uh, uh, Mork uh, posted uh, one song uh, on uh, our YouTube channel, so you can check that out uh, på tvärs av live uh, at Vakken. And uh, I can't even put it into words how huge this was for us. It was has been a goal. All the way since uh, the live band uh, got put together uh, now in how many years ago? Two, 2015. So thanks to Vaken and uh, thanks to all of you who showed up and uh, made it a proper uh, in- introduction and black mass for Mork at Vaken Open Air. We then uh, returned to Midgarsblot, the the Viking-themed uh, festival over here in Norway, which was great. We played uh, the opening night, and uh, the, it was a big crowd, a big turnout, and I think uh, everyone had a good time. Even though it's black metal, it's not allowed to have a good time, right? But I'm sure we all had a, a little bit of a good time. That's just how it is. Uh, that was in August, uh, the same as Vakken. And uh, later in August, we returned to Poland. We haven't been there since 2015, which was the first Mork show ever, uh, January 15. Uh, back then we played in uh, Olsztyn. But this time we went to uh, a city called Piskowice, or Piskowice, however you pronounce that. Uh, a free of charge uh, festival, uh, Nietzsche Sisa Milchi festival, and uh, that was a great time. Uh, we headlined that uh, evening, and it was a great turnout. Great to be back in Poland, and uh, great organizers. We had a good time, and then, my friends, we actually went overseas and visited Latin and South America for the first time in the band's history. The same as the Vakken deal, Uh, this has been put off for a couple of years, but now we finally made it happen. So uh, a big salute to Toomba Productions for having us over there and uh, organizing the entire tour. Uh, We flew to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and played at a festival there, uh, Setembro Negro Festival. 
uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, we played together with Legends as uh, Diamond Head and uh, Raven, which was a great time. We actually uh got to we, we got to know get to know diamond head and the boys there from england we had a good time we went to a karaoke bar believe it or not and when diamond head came to oslo this only a couple of weeks ago together with saxon uh, we actually went in there and uh got to hang out again which was great uh we then played uh, montevideo uruguay we played in Buenos Aires, Argentina. We played Asuncion in uh, Paraguay, uh, Bogota, Colombia, and Mexico City in Mexico. Uh, the tour was supposed to include Costa Rica and Chile, and maybe El Salvador as well, but those three uh, fell off or uh, disappeared. The, the concerts were we cancelled a long time ago, actually. But what we were a bit bummed about is that when we landed in Sao Paulo, and I think the second day or something, uh, still in Sao Paulo, we got to know that even another show was cancelled, and that was Lima, Peru, uh, due to some uh, visa complications or something like that. Uh, out of our hands, basically. So that sucked. So that day b became a, a travel day and a day off. We only changed flights in Lima. But uh, we are hassling uh, and bugging uh, Toomba these days to make up for all that and maybe make a return and uh, visit the countries that we didn't get to see this time. And uh, maybe even return to the ones we did see, which would be great. It was awesome to meet a lot of you over there. Uh, passionate people and uh, rowdy crowds. We had a few really great concerts over there, uh, crowd-wise and response-wise. We had a good time. And uh, we, uh, on the spot, each night after soundcheck, I believe it was, we made up new set lists. So there was, uh, there, there was a variety in the set list uh, throughout the whole tour. So uh, every one of you got to see a bit diff uh, different show each night. If I'm sounding a bit nasally now, that's because I have a flu and, uh, or a cold, so my nose is stuffed. Sorry about that. A cool thing uh, regarding the South American tour is that uh, we actually made uh, two different uh, tour t-shirts this time around. We never do that because it's, I don't know, you know how it is. It's a bit scary to print any kind of merchandise that's basically uh, aimed at uh, a particular concert or a particular tour because you never know how much you will sell. We sold most of them, uh, uh, brought the rest back home. We have a few left. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I will put a few of them out on the web shop in time. We have been selling them to friends and stuff over here too. Um but regarding the shirts, I, uh, I bought a couple of uh, prints from uh, David Thierry, uh, the same French gentleman who has been doing my album art now for years. He made a really cool uh, Raven shirt for us, uh, which I named Ravnens uh, Natterike Kaller, which is a track from the second album, Den Valde de Skygge. And he made a troll t-shirt, which uh, I put the text to uh, s uh, Norsk Svart Metal, Norwegian Black Metal. And uh, on both t-shirts, the tour dates are on the back. So, you know, it, that was a first for us, I believe. I don't think we ever did anything similar to that. We had a ex exclusive t-shirt for the show we did in Izmir, Turkey, back in... 2018 or whenever it was no 2017 but uh yeah every once in a while we we are crazy and make some exclusive merch so that's cool i suppose before i forget a uh, big uh, hails and uh, cheers to our fellow uh, bands on the tour Mork was headlining and we had direct support uh, from the from the great uh, californian death metal band Skeletal Remains and uh, the 
the Holland or Netherland band uh, Soulburn, a black metal band from over there in the Netherlands. Great people to share the stage with each night. As well as a even greater thank you to our uh, our tour manager, William. He, uh, I don't know, he just kept it together. Uh, warts and all, you know, over there, South, uh, South and Latin America has a bit of a reputation of being uh, a bit corrupt uh, when it comes to uh, governments, airports, and police and everything. And um, he got us through all, all of it. So more power to you, William. Hopefully we will see you again down the line. We then returned uh, to Norway. We played uh, the Northern Deception Festival in Kristiansand in September. Uh, later, uh, only a few days after that, actually, we played the Spetakkel Festival in Larvik, Norway, which was uh, Mork Show number 100. So kind of an anniversary in a way. Uh, we then uh, played uh, what I believe is the year's last concert, actually, at uh, Mörkaste Småland over in our neighbor and brother country in Sweden, uh, in Hulsfred. That was uh, the 10th of, uh, no, sorry, the 8th of uh, October. No more shows this year, uh, as of now. Who knows, maybe something comes along, but uh, doesn't look it at the moment. If so, we will uh, keep you posted on the socials and stuff. I also got to release yet another vinyl record, actually, uh, an EP, Den Svevende Festning, which uh, basically is uh, compiled of uh, a couple of unreleased uh, and unused tracks from the Cathedral sessions uh, and... uh, which is uh, Den Svevende Festning, Ormtunge, uh, and a new mix and version of uh, Føttel og Herske, which has some uh, strings that is provided by the very great Freddy Horm. Thanks. And uh, a couple of live tracks from the concert we did at Centrum Sen in Oslo, Norway, uh, in the 2021. Uh, I suppose that was the delayed release concert for Cathedral. Great evening, great evening, even though it was uh, a pandemic uh, restriction kind of deal with se- uh, only seated audience and stuff, but it's a huge and great venue over there in Oslo and we had a great time. And uh, the recording, uh, the outcome was awesome, so we we had to put it out in one way or another, you know. Uh, thanks to Espen Jamne for the sound on the live recording. Uh, and also thank thank you to all of you who have been buying the vinyl. There was uh, one, uh, 150 uh, numbered uh, copies. That's all gone. And uh, I think it was about a thousand pressed in total. And those are running out too, which is awesome. I have uh, at a web shop perhaps... 15 or 20 copies now if you want to uh, make sure to get your own and uh, the Peaceville has the rest uh, that's not been uh, distributed though obviously uh, across the globe as luckily Peaceville Records is a great label that has a massive distribution network which is great I remember uh, back in 2019 when we went to Los Angeles I went to the uh, the great and uh, well known uh, Amoeba Records uh, I think it's on the South Strip, I'm not sure but my point being we I went to Amoeba Records and I fucking found my albums in there on vinyl and uh, it says it all Peaceville Records man, fucking awesome uh, present day then any news? Well, yeah, actually it is. I just uh, I just remember that in December, Peaceville Records will actually release a compilation album. Uh, I just really quickly need to find the title. Shit. Hang on. Dark Side of the Sacred Star, which is basically 
a compilation on vinyl uh, consisting only of black metal bands from Peaceville, uh, the Peaceville uh, roster. And then we are in fucking great company there. Uh, Dark Throne, Mortem, Psy, uh, Mortuary Drape, Hell Ripper, Dödheim's God, and even Thorns has uh, a little something on there. Uh, the Mork song that is included is actually a leftover track from the upcoming new album. And uh, it's entitled uh, All Runen's Heaven. Um, as always, I uh, I record way too much, and uh, some tracks are getting left behind. And uh, we got the use for this one right away on this compilation. But the, the song is great. It's just I don't know. It didn't fit the album as the other tracks, basically. Sometimes you just have to kill your babies, you know. Um, our vinyl records can only hold uh, so much information before it starts um, sounding crap. But hey, there you go. Now you know that uh, there's a new album coming next year. Looking forward to getting that stuff out. Been uh, been carrying that around for a while now. So it's time. This week's episode, uh, I have the, the pleasure of visiting uh, my friend Mikael Siusius, also known as Sykeli. Uh, he's the founder of the black metal band Den So Kalte, which uh, started back in the mid-2000s, I believe. Had a great time over there. Uh, he's also a, a bar owner uh, of the only rock or metal pub in Notodden. Uh, Telerock. A great uh, Friday and Saturday over there in uh, yet another capital city in the black metal world, uh, Notodden. Most of you know Emperor. Join me uh, in my conversation with uh, Mikael. Uh, from Greece to Norway to present day and everything in between. Enjoy! Har du lyd eller far? Ja, du måste ha det. Så trenger du trenger du mer än den nivån då? Nej då. Nej, det blir fint där. Okay. Brukar kompressorer och sånt ja, ja. Vet Vill du ha något headset eller? Nej. Det är er inte sån radio stämma alltså. Jag får liksom kicka och höra min egen stämma alltså i den här. Känns som det är er på radio. Ah oh, fuck man. Men vi vi tar det på engelsk. We will take it on English. I'm sorry to say. Uh, it's been a very long time now since I made a podcast. Uh, when, when, who was the last one? The last one was uh, Iro Puri, a uh, Finnish gentleman uh, who plays the pump organ in the funeral doom band Skepticism. Okay. I went to his house in uh, Finland this summer, and <coughs> since then it's been a dry season for the podcast. So it's uh, about time we got this thing settled. And uh, I'm sitting in the basement now in a home studio, which is fucking cozy with black metal posters and uh, proper bands on the walls and guitars and shit. I'm sitting in the house of uh, the CEO and manager of Telerock and uh, and the founder of uh, Den So Kalte. And uh, that is, thank you very much, Sykeli is the artist name. And the real name is uh, Michael, and the last name I'm a bit curious about. The, the last name is uh, something the Lopp 
paper has been struggling with the, the past five years they haven't managed to say or write it properly <laughs> I can, I can until that. now uh, it's uh, Seussius it's uh, I wouldn't say it's typical Greek but uh, it sounds Greek uh, in, in a sense yeah sure sure yeah. But Michael isn't a traditional Greek name, I think, is it? Yeah, in the sense of uh, the way you say it right now, no. It's uh, the, the typical way of uh, of presenting the name, I guess, is based on uh, the Christian books uh, like Mikael. Mikael. Some, uh, uh, that, that is like one of the archangels, right? So, so your parents uh, say Mikael? Mm. Okay. Yeah, there you go. In Norway, we say Mikael. Mikael. Yeah, that, um, I guess that's the... And, and that's why I use it also. It's uh, based on the way it sounds. Yeah. It, it, it's the closest to the, the actual name, to the original Yeah, and uh, you know, in proper Norwegian, it's Mikael. But in Østfold, or <coughs> what is now called Viken in mm. Holden, we say Mikael. Yeah. The E is silent, says so Mikal. That's a yeah, very yeah, that's uh, Eastern way of saying it. <laughs> quite Swedish, maybe. Yeah, maybe Mikal. Yeah, I yeah. suppose. I live close to the border. Uh, so cheap uh, cheap uh, booze and... Uh... Cheap uh, cigarettes and alcohol and no. meat. Rock and roll. Yes, man. <laughs> okay, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was a great time last night. Yeah. You fed us with a fucking pork belly <laughs> with the size of a baby's head. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, it's uh, I have it as a tradition when it comes to people uh, visiting me that okay. uh, I'm gonna be the one that uh, is gonna be cooking, and it, it ends up that uh, uh, people get to the point they're about to vomit <laughs> because of the portions. So that is very correct. Yeah, you I, manage. I, I have no control uh, when it comes to the portions. I guess it's kind of like uh, my songwriting. I, I cannot stop at, uh, for example, at five minutes. It's impossible. Ah, fantastic. So all the songs end up like eight or nine minutes. The, the new album has a song that is uh, 10 minutes and 40 seconds. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's not the typical uh, black metal uh, songwriting for you. I guess. Black metal has a lot of long songs. It's just how it is, you know. Uh, at least in some atmospheric parts, you know. Not based on blast beats, uh, I guess. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> Ten minutes with blast beats, that's a bit yeah. overkill, if you ask me. <laughs> no, I don't think, uh, I really don't think that we're gonna even try playing the, this song uh, live. Oh, uh, not? Okay. I, I don't think so. Leave it for the album. We, we have it as a plan, uh, because it has been like... Um, the previous album was released in 2014, so yeah. we're talking about eight years. Uh, it goes nine years now. In preparation uh, for this album? Uh, not not really preparation. It has been the absence is nine years. Uh, when it comes to the preparation, I guess it's something uh, I've been working with the last four years, maybe. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the reason that there has been like nine years absence is basically uh, private shit and tragedies and problems. Yeah. You know, and uh, I guess, you know, um, I'm the kind of person that I can't really ignore problems. I can hide behind my finger and... Uh, focus for example in writing music instead of focusing on the problem no 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 so no. i'm fixing the problem and thereafter you know i can focus on any other things for me the, the, if there's problems there's always problems you know we're people and humans there's always mm. problems but the music part happens to be kind of a therapy for me then you know the, the music is therapy but mm. at the same time uh, when when you experience uh, let's say the basic parts of life being chaotic yeah. uh, in a sense the the music will also turn out uh, a bit of a chaos oh or, yeah or maybe for example th th there has been situations that I've tried to write songs during these uh, periods of time yeah. and it ended up like uh, after recording, for example, that I would go back to the song and uh, see that, okay, 
the the riff positioning for example is not something i would normally do yeah uh so i decide basically to discard the whole product and start all over again yeah so sometimes I, I, yeah sometimes that's the <laughs> the way it needs to be you know i guess you have experienced it with your band also that you know you you made something that can stand oh, yes but at the same time you you don't feel 100 you know that it's there that it's the thing you would like to i a, i i define uh, define that as a writer's block yeah. and uh, that is a big issue for me when i first uh, run into a writer's block i get depressed as fuck uh, i guess the um, and that's how basically i use the last years is that i made different versions of things mm. and uh, in the end uh, i wasn't really satisfied with almost any of those things but uh, i had uh, shit loads of riffs yeah and you know i ended up going to this library uh, of four years with uh, riffs and you know with clean head you you come to uh, the point that okay you take that one and that one and that one and all of a sudden it makes sense instead of trying and struggling you yeah. know don't force it exactly don't force it if uh, i always write music alone i suppose you do too yeah and if it doesn't flow then i know it just stop it is not worth it the thing is that for the first time uh right now uh with this album it <coughs> was the first time that me and someone else actually s sat together and uh created a song oh yeah the new album is gonna have a song um uh, that uh, me and uh, vidar uh partially uh made together and uh surprisingly it turned out uh, the process turned out really um really smooth i would say uh, because we had this kind of uh, day that we, we didn't sat we didn't sit down in order to uh, say okay <clears throat> let's stress for four or five hours in order and see what we get uh, he came to, to visit here at home and uh, we basically used the whole day you know sitting drinking wine and talking about different things and mm. when we decided to grab the guitars you know um it, it would be like uh maybe i would be on my way to the toilet and he would be playing some random things and i what i would hear you know on my way to the toilet would be like oh shit okay this is good play it again so we ended up basically making a song based on this kind of riffing and this kind of playing that uh, just we, sparring of yeah, each other we, we were playing random random shit and uh, in in the end you know 80 percent of uh, those things were in the song yeah that's the way creativity works you know but uh, we need to go way back we need to go back to your origins and beginnings hmm. this podcast is uh, i don't know if you listen to any of the episodes i've done from before but it's basically this is your hour you just tell your story <coughs> yeah with uh, as much filth and stuff as you wish to include of course <laughs> but you have a, had a fascinating run you know you grew up in greece we can just start there how uh, was it to grow up there yeah the the family is basically originated um northwest I come from a region that is called Epirus, uh, and based on uh, based on research I did when my father uh, was uh, still alive, we found out that the family is not uh, hadn't been in Greece for many generations. It was like three or four generations oh. uh, <coughs> in uh, in Greece. So. Uh, we found out that uh, the origins of the family are someplace uh, in Czechoslovakia, somewhere there. So uh, I didn't grow up. Uh, I didn't grow up uh, in that part. The, I still have family house 
there after my father, uh, with uh, whom uh, he died in 2015. Oh. So uh, I grew up in Athens uh, with uh, seven million uh, other idiots <laughs> around. <laughs> and uh, it didn't take that long uh basically to see that my personality didn't really fit oh. uh with the whole lifestyle or uh, i don't know how else to to present it uh it's uh let's take for example my sister if you're gonna see how my sister talks to uh, her kids or her friends or other people you know she can be the nicest person and really polite and everything but the way that she talks to these people uh for any other nationality when you listen the way you think that oi um she's quite pissed off <laughs> she's, she's quite angry and that's the way i guess most of the things in Greece are. It's very, uh, things are very intense. Oh. Uh, you're intense the way you talk, you're intense with what you feel. Everything has to be to the maximum. Um, this is not something I can cope with. Uh, I get extremely tired oh. by experiencing this. And that's why I say that my personality never kind of fell to the same place with the rest of the population. You know, I, I never really felt home. I wanted something that is going to go slower and, you know, a bit more uh, mellow in a way. Mm. And uh, that's why I ended up uh, in Oslo the first uh, two years when I moved. And when Oslo also became too much for me, then moved to Newton. Yeah. And I think that with 12,000 people, it's something that I can feel more comfortable. It's it, This is what feels home, I guess. Not open. Yeah. yeah. Like the small village kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, I would say that um, based, on, based on the fact that I do the kind of work I do, mm. and that I decided somehow i don't really fucking know how i decided starting a bar because i'm not actually uh that much social i don't really like talking to many people uh, at the same time and uh i guess this is a step it's maybe Maybe it's something like a therapy, you know, yeah. that uh, by doing this kind of work, I set myself in a different perspective and become what I wasn't up, yeah. to, up to now. You're kind of renewing yourself then. So <clears throat> at the same time that I live in a, a small city, uh, you know, I have, I, I have an extreme social work that needs a lot of uh, of my attention and um, I, I guess i have found the right balance in order not to be bored by something and uh, at the same time feel uh, both uh, relaxed with it and uh, not tired like i would feel for example in Athens or uh, later on in uh, oslo yeah for oslo and it kind of ended up like, you know, you would go to work early in the day and uh, there would always be someone that would call and say, oh, let's go to Elm Street, have a, have a burger and beers. And, you know, the one beer w was never one. No, yes, <laughs> it, I know it. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was 10 <laughs> or uh, 15. And then you come to a point, okay, um, do I really want that? Yeah. And uh, is it going to be like that up until I'm 50 and bald uh, with a big belly? And, yep. You know. Shrinking liver. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
at, at the same time, I I wanted to have you know, I wanted to build up to have my own home and uh, family and all these things. So I don't think Oslo is the right place, especially with these prices uh, when it comes oh, no. to. Uh, It's too stressful for me. Yeah. So uh, it was. I think it was the right thing to decide to move to the countryside. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, how was it uh, in while uh, before you moved to uh, Norway? Then you were a part of the metal scene, right? Can you tell a little bit about that? In, in, uh, in I Athens? grew up, as I said, I grew up in Athens, and mm. I guess I was one of the lucky bastards uh, back then, growing up uh, right beside uh, really cool persons of the scene. I grew up uh, when I was 12, 13 years old, you know. I be, I started becoming friends with uh, members from Necromantia, members from Rotting Christ, Nightfall, Septic Flesh, and uh, uh, in in a way I was really lucky because the scene back then was really small. It was like uh, as we discussed also earlier, uh, we had for example a concert with uh, Samael and Rotting Christ in 1993, mm. and it. For this concert, they there were people coming from the whole country, yeah, uh, to Athens in order to experience this uh, gig, and we weren't more than 120 people, I guess. So the scene was really, really small, mm -hmm. and by having such small scene, uh, I think it was really, really cool that I got to know. Uh, As said, uh, persons from the great Greek bands and uh, working even with them. Uh, because at that point, uh, Molon Lave Records had uh, like, uh, 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 what do you call it, a music store? Yeah. Selling demos and uh, 17 inches and all the first at that time. Uh, Big releases of uh, extreme metal bands and Os stuff. Osmos productions. It's like Helvete, as you told me yeah, earlier today. It, it was something like that. Yeah. Uh, it was really cool going to that place, uh, for example, on a Saturday, because it would be like uh, 30, 40 persons. Like sit, a cafe, metal yeah, cafe. Si sitting together and discussing demos and discussing releases or uh, at Uh, it was really funny at that, that time because uh, I was on my way to that record store uh, uh, back in the day and on my way uh, to the record store, you know, it was in the center of Athens. So in the center of Athens there were uh, kiosks that uh, would sell uh, international newspapers. Yeah. So. There was one day that uh, I spotted the uh, Norwegian newspapers and it was fucking back week and as, uh, you know, the front page. I was like, what the hell is this? You the know? famous front page. Uh, and, and the thing is that you didn't have internet at, uh, at that time, mm. right? So I would actually go to the record store and say, okay, I saw this, what is happening? And, you know, there were, there, there were people that would call people they knew and we found out many different things were happening up here. So uh, I think it was uh, really cool days to look back to. Mm. And uh, as, as I told you earlier also, um, the music coming uh, from the bands uh, at that time was exceptional. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I feel lucky that I've been a part of it. But what what kind of became the Hellenic sound? You think what is that? Is that a combination of the drum beats that we listened to earlier with uh, snare and hi hat? I guess the mighty contract uh, from uh, Rotten Christ actually made the path for uh, the sound. Yeah, for mm. every other band uh, coming from uh, Greece at yeah. that time. It was, uh, and of course you had bands like Necromantia that uh, didn't really sound like any other band uh, in the world. Um, but Necromantia it was, a, you know, it's a chapter 
for itself. You, you can't touch it. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, stands on its own. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Varthon, I guess Varthon, Rodney Christ uh, were the ones that with their riffing and uh, and uh, the drum bits uh, kind cre- of really cre- cre- yeah. really created a trend. Yeah, back in the day. What would you say was the inspiration for the Hellenic sound? Is it like the typical thing with Venom, Ketty Frost, and Maybe well, it, sarcophago, perhaps. Uh, it started like that. Yeah. Uh, it started like that, but uh, I guess, I guess, when it comes to uh, the Greek scene, uh, the influence the first bands had uh, was enormous. So uh, there, there were many back in the day that uh, in the nineties that. Uh, would first, for example, go through the Greek bands and then develop, uh, go into a Bathory or a Celtic Frost. Okay. And uh, I guess there were many that did that. And there were many uh, that went through the Norwegian sound later on before uh, discovering, you know, Celtic Frost or uh, Bathory. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, would that, would that like be a blaze in the northern sky and burst, yeah, or would it a be a blaze in the northern sky? Uh, I don't know if you have uh, noticed a blaze in the northern sky. Um, it has uh, a thanks uh, text uh, to Necromantia. Yeah, it does actually. So yeah. the, the, there were many, for example, that uh, tried listening to Darkthorn based on that they were really much into Necromantia. Oh, yeah. So the, the, there were connections like that. And, uh, I suppose the guys tape traded back in the day then. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Letters and stuff. L- lots of it. But did you ever uh, get into a band while living in Greece? Well, I've been playing music. Uh, I've been playing music since 93. Mm-hmm. Uh I've been in uh, different projects, making albums up until 2000, 2004, before deciding in 2005, uh, moving to Norway. But what was your first band? And, uh, wh- why did you pick up the guitar in the first place? Well, um, li- like you said earlier, it's uh, you have... Two options. If you feel uh, that uh, something is troubling you mentally, mm. one is visiting a doctor. The other is uh, being artistic about yep. it. Absolutely. So uh, I I chose the second option, and uh, um, with the first band that I uh, started, I made like I think we made like four albums before me moving to uh oh really before moving to norway yeah yeah on a label four, four yeah, albums yeah. on a label mm. uh, which band was uh, this i played guitars for uh, narmatarn and uh, if i remember let's see one two three i think it was like five official releases did you make the music I made uh, when it comes to the first two albums. Let's say that I made like ninety yeah. percent of the material, and third, fourth album it was like fifty percent. Yeah, no, sixty percent of the third album, around fifty percent of the fourth album. But how did you get into songwriting in the first place? Was that the first album, the first thing you wrote, or did you write stuff before that? Like songs, no, I, I guess uh, I guess I was lucky enough that uh, my first creations, my my first composing creations, got to be released. You know, yeah, that's a bit right special. after because we were signed at that time. We were signed uh, by uh, the record label of uh, Magus from uh, Necromantia. Mm. Uh, so th- th- that's the cool thing I, I said earlier that I was lucky enough growing up with cool people. So yeah. uh, I think it's uh, I have 
enormous respect for uh, Magus from uh, Necromantia. So uh, I was feeling really lucky that I had this guy in my life that was respecting me and, uh, A support the, system. and, and, and at the same time uh, <coughs> liking uh, the way I create art. You know. So this scene seems like it was a supportive scene. Everyone was cheering each other on, uh, you not have, backstabbing each other. Uh, you always gonna have uh, things like that. Uh, some and, sour uh, grapes, of course. Yeah. It's. Um, I guess uh, in, in a way, it's something nice because it creates competition and it. That's true. A healthy it, it, competition. And healthy than the. There is no health, uh, healthy situation nowhere in life. Uh, you know, you, you always try to be above others. You know, of course. That, that's how it is. The survival and, of the fittest. And, and, and that's exactly what Christianity uh, is opposing, and that is why Christianity doesn't fucking work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or any religion at that. So. Well, <laughs> you, you know, you you want to be the best, and uh, I think it's good having people pushing you in a way uh, being better mm. than the others yeah so uh, yeah i have no problem with that but did you ever uh, i suppose you played live with the band yeah we actually played uh, i think one of the last concerts i played with that band was uh, inferno festival in 2005 i think but did you get to travel anything before that with the band no not really only local gigs yeah what was your first gig First gig would be um, first gig would be with a, together with another Greek band called uh, Kavir. Uh, we played in Athens in uh, I think it was ninety seven. Yeah, no, that late. Ni- ninety six, ninety seven. Yeah, yeah. How was that? How was it to debut on stage? <laughs> it, it, it's a love and hate situation uh, because I like playing but at the same time I get really frustrated with the preparations of uh, playing live Mm -hmm. Uh, it tires me a lot and for example when I toured uh, in 2007 I toured with uh, Gorgoroth I played the session guitars for uh, the European tour in 2007 and we played 35 concerts yeah, or 34 concerts in 35 days yeah and uh, I was when I came back home I was done I was completely done drained and, you know after the it, it also depends on you know how you do things and uh, back at that time uh, you know I would wake up early in the morning and instead of brushing my teeth I would clean my mouth with, with uh, Mintu. Yeah. So um, I guess we're too oh, old. The, the, the spirit? <laughs> no, the, I, I the guess we're, we're too old for this uh, right now. But, uh, you know, uh, at that point, it was like uh, after the 10th day, you mm. would wake up and uh, you would start shaking, you know. And it was fun when it happened. But, you know, I was, I was drained uh, for two months after that. Uh, we need to get back to this. Uh, we're jumping a bit back and yeah. forth in time now, but uh, we need to get into the Gorgorot story for sure. But uh, before that, we need to go back to Greece. And uh, so you released albums, you played some local shows, and then uh, you decided to leave for Norway. What happened there? Uh, I guess I had enough with uh, the way of life. It didn't represent me. Uh based on my personality i guess i yeah. got i got tired i wanted uh, like i said earlier i wanted something that the mind would feel uh, eased so it was basically because of the music that you moved here no it wasn't no i guess and i i wouldn't say it was the music i the music of course had you know a, a big deal in my decision because I already had lots of friends in Oslo. I knew Oslo quite well before. Oh, you have been here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, visiting. Yeah. yeah, so I already had friends. I already knew how Oslo was and, you know, uh, it made sense 
for me moving to uh, to Norway. Um, so you came here alone, no yeah. friends or stuff. You just traveled by yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah decided to move country. So uh, <clears throat> I haven't regretted the the whole thing. It's been like seventeen years now. Yeah, uh, almost eighteen years. So you you managed to get yourself uh, a flat in Oslo and a I steady was really, job. I, I was I was really lucky that uh, one of the good friends I have, uh, Yusuf from uh, Dödhemsgard, yes, uh, stepped in and uh, you know he offered that I would stay with him uh, the first month. So uh, I, I was really lucky. I'm eternally grateful for all the help I got from Yusuf. Um, he, I make sure that I tell him that quite often. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be the un- ungrateful uh, bastard. So uh, I'm really grateful for uh, that he stood uh, as a good friend. Oh, so you basically then, came off the plane, got your shit, and then went and lived the, with the, him. The, there are many people that you know they change country or other people when they ask me why I moved, you know, the the first two things that they're going to think of is uh, a girl, that I found a girl from the, uh, in Norway and moved because of that, hmm. or it's uh, money, you know, that... Yeah, work or whatever. They, they decided to move because of um, some kind of work that uh, I would earn more mm. compared to Yes, what that's I, a typical one, classic. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason that I moved to Norway and why... Uh, it was Norway is that uh, it fitted with my personality the in the best way yeah um, so uh, stayed with Yusuf the first two three months that was quite interesting at that time we also had uh, last month of me staying with Yusuf we also had uh, Niklas from Shining yeah. <laughs> living in the same apartment and, Swedish uh, Niklas yeah uh, that, that's also how we started uh, with uh, Niklas being also the vocalist in uh, in the Den, band in Den Solkalta. Yeah, but uh, why, why did Niklas move in there? What was the story there? Uh, I guess Niklas is uh, Niklas, if I remember right. Uh, was it was that his first time in Oslo living there, or was he uh, already living there? Uh, I think so. I I think it was the first time. It was a really I can't remember exactly what what had happened <clears throat> i think there was some kind of story back then in the media that he's dead what well, uh, was it that period i heard and, about this and he just disappeared for a while yeah he disappeared and then there, there was rumors all over the place that uh, he was dead and uh, i think the first month him living in oslo it was quite uh, you know underground that uh, it was it, it, while the secret was on yeah ongoing okay but after that uh, I, uh, I think it was the second or third month he started uh, also bartending at uh, rockin at rockin yeah okay old rockin uh, at uh, stortinge yes so uh, and if i remember right he he was also bartending. There was another club at that time in Oslo, uh, Maiden, I think. Yes. Was, I think it was, he was there as well. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know how much of a secret it was that uh, he was living in Oslo. Obviously when, not. <laughs> when, I don't know. When so many people... Uh, I heard the story that he went on the ground, he was dead, he was gone, and then he was supposed to do a big comeback show. Which was a fucking disaster. It was? Uh, yeah. Was that in Harmstad or was it in Oslo? It was in... Uh, it was a really funny situation because we actually had uh, the, the, there were many people from Oslo so we hired a bus yeah I heard about this and there were like 60 70 people from Oslo that uh, we traveled to uh, Halmstad to, to Halmstad yeah and uh, Sweden Niklas had arranged uh, for that concert because he wanted to uh shock in different ways so he wanted to have all kind of uh, all kind of uh, ages in that concert 
So it was an alcohol-free concert. Oh, really? Which sucked big time. Everyone was <laughs> quite pissed that uh, we couldn't even fucking drink a beer in uh, that concert. And it turned out that nobody in Sweden actually believed that Shining would play. So no one from Sweden fucking showed up. It was like five, six persons. And basically the whole fucking club in Halmstad, it was just people from Norway. All the bus, the bus load. <laughs> the bus from Norway. So um, <clears throat> I think it was it was Attila also uh, guesting oh, yeah. uh, on stage. Yeah. And I think it was Venerik from Mayhem. That sounds right. Uh, being there. I think Jörn was uh, there too. Wasn't he? I cannot fucking remember. I think I was told that. I never. I wasn't there, but uh, I heard about it. Of but course. I guess when it comes to the highlight of the whole experience, it was the Hemsgard that you know was the, uh, the opening act. Okay. For the concert. Yeah. So. Uh, Dirt Hemsgard uh, was quite cool, actually. To uh, was in that uh, period. A great band, great band, and I just for the record, I'm a huge fan of Shining. You know, mm. I think uh, what he has hit, uh, he he has hit a nerve there that hits home with me. Yeah. At least the early albums. Uh, uh, Nicholas is a talented uh, person, and at uh, the same time, uh, I think he's quite clever choosing the members uh, he wants to have in uh, Shining. It's uh, so. uh, interesting to see now what's going on because he just uh, made a new band, new lineup. No, uh, I think it was, it's Barker now yeah, playing. Nick Barker is in drums. the band. Yeah. And a new album. I haven't heard anything of it, I think. it's not, Nothing is out there yet, but that will be interesting. I haven't listened to the last things, but uh, the, the old the old stuff is... Uh, the eerie cold stuff? Yeah. Fucking fantastic. Uh, the first album, too. Angst is a really cool album. It's perfect mm-hmm. amount of depressive yeah. mood, you know? I guess later on it became quite... Um, Nicholas chose to have like a pop formula in a, a, little w- bit. In, in a way. A bit more Polish sound yeah. too. And uh, that, that's not something that uh, I would go for. You know, it's not what I enjoy sitting, listening at home. Yeah, but so, you know, every artist needs to evolve a bit and yeah, yeah, try not, stuff. Uh, I'm not criticizing, no, but, no, no, but no. at the same time I can choose. That, that's the magical thing. Yeah, of, of life that you can reject and you can focus on things you like. Absolutely. So uh, the, the later things, it's not something that uh, I would enjoy. But uh, the old stuff is a uh, goal. In the later years, he actually did a cover of the Norwegian band uh, Simon, uh, yeah. a song called Om, hmm. which is fucking fantastic, by the way. Have I you heard I, that? I think I've seen it also live. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that was a great one, actually. But when we're talking about Niklas, uh, how did you guys, uh, you you moved together in the apartment with um, Yusuf, Yusuf mm. but how did you start a project together? How was that? Oh, it was uh, in that period of time. Uh, then so uh when started, it was in my head that it's going to be like a one-month project and, <clears throat> and that's it. Mm. And uh, it ended up with uh, you know when playing the songs to to different friends it turned out that you know fuck it you know you can be along in the the whole idea so uh, first it was a tour uh, or else uh, Sideman from uh, 349 that uh, joined then Sokalte after tour, uh, it was uh, Ole that was playing uh, keyboards and effects uh, in Dead Hemsgard. Yeah, and then uh, and then it was uh, Niklas that uh, joined in. And uh, I just need to ask: yeah. Is is the the the, um, the name of the band? Is it from the Webboons and uh, song? Na- name of the band basically. Um, comes from uh, Vedbun and uh, that uh, I loved uh, since the first day I listened to. Yeah. And 
I guess that particular uh, that particular uh, title represents you know uh, represents me in the best way. It's a that, it's, it's uh, a strong title. Yeah, yeah that, in a way you um, you are the outcast. You you are the one that you know the other persons are pointing with a finger that the you know, so-called uh, outcast yeah. so uh, uh in, in the the cool thing with it is that it can have many different uh interpretations yep um uh, you can even uh depict you as satan you know with this uh that is what i thought the first time i heard the name yeah you know so um, it, it's like you choose yourself, you know, yeah. what you want it to represent, and that's the cool thing with the title. And Absolutely. For for me, it uh, it speaks in the way of the outcast that I was never the person that would uh, go with the general thinking. You know, I, I would be separately. Uh, I would be separate with uh, from the rest. Mm. Uh, by choice yeah so um, it came from uh, the influence came from uh, Vedbun Sanda hmm. and with the years it became your own my own thing yes. you know a personal thing yeah cool thanks how was it to start making music then for this project um I guess uh what was the influences? Depression. Yeah. Lots of depression at that time. And uh, depression and frustration, I guess. Mm. And uh, um, the, there are many people that have listened to the demo uh, versions uh, from 2007. Uh, and later on listen to the actual album, the first album from Avant-Garde in 2009. Mm. And they said, and they still do, that uh, the versions from 2007, even if they're not, you know, the production is really crap and there are mistakes even uh, with the drums and guitars here and there, uh, they say that they actually <coughs> enjoy the 2000, 2007 versions the demo more yep. compared to the actual album and the reason that they they prefer those versions are that every fucking single member in Denso Kalte in that period of time uh, struggled with something oh yeah the, there was lots of tension coming from every single one of us and uh, lots of depression I guess at that time so uh, it um, this material it has a really fucking special vibe have you released that? It. Uh, it's been released as a El Merkel depression the, the, the demo? yeah oh, okay that's the demo mm. gotcha but well, that... I, I think I, I think I've given you a copy a vinyl copy of it is that that one i think so i need to check when i get back home yeah i think so but uh that, that that's precisely why i never demo anymore i try not to record songs uh, more times than one to lose the spontaneous and rawness you know yeah i don't want to record a demo and then re-record the song well the thing is that um by including these songs in the first album mm. um what I guess it's the human brain that is doing this, is that you want to correct the things you did wrong the first yeah, time. Yeah, you're a perfectionist. That's yeah. just the way it is. But at the same time, by doing that, you reduce the magic from the whole from the whole vibe. Yeah. And um, I have regretted uh, quite a lot, for example, when it comes to the drum sound of the first album. Mm. I think it's too artificial i would like the drum sound to be you know more natural yeah. uh, so but it is what it is and you know yeah yeah you need to stand behind the product anyway uh, at least i know at this point of my life I, I know how i want things to sound yeah so 
But it was the start, the beginning period of that band, you know, and I suppose... How did you get a record deal? <coughs> uh, the record deal basically came uh, quite easily. I had uh, I had uh, Italian label, Eerie Art, releasing the demo in a professional uh, format, uh, CDs, and uh, when it comes to the... First version, second version, second edition was like a digipack from uh, Aesthetic Death and uh, vinyl, double vinyl. Also, so you actually re released the demo before the re-recorded recorded album? The demo was released uh, first, actually, officially. It was, it, it was released, uh, the, the, that was a bit, uh, the, the, that's a cool thing, actually, what happened back then. In 2008, we released uh, the demo yeah. in uh, CD format mm. through Eerie Art. Yeah. And Lars from uh, Inferno Festival, uh, he listened to the songs and he thought, ah, it's really fucking cool material. And, you know, you can you can play with a band at uh, Inferno Festival. I was like, yeah, okay, then we have this as first official uh, concert. concert. Yeah. Uh, what uh, was really, you know, surprising, based on that, we we never played live uh, together as then so called before that concert, and the CD wasn't even out, and there, there were really really few people knowing about the band at that point, and uh, I remember it was like uh, this uh, official concert. Uh, Inferno has where they're revealing the whole lineup of the festival. Wow. So, uh, on, in that concert, you know, we got to see that, uh, oh shit, we, we're actually headlining the fucking festival. <laughs> so, we headlined uh, Saturday at uh, John D. Yeah. And the, the cool thing about it is uh, that. Um, we were headliners with no one having listened to the music. Oh, that's a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> with no one having listened to the music. And on the day we played, I, I think it was, uh, yeah, it, it was Satyricon, you know, after uh, then so called. Yeah, on the main stage. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So. I had no expectations, you know. I, 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 the expectation I had was like, okay, some people are gonna get interested, you know, finding out how it's gonna be and you know what the band is about, and you know, it's Inferno Festival, so at least there's gonna be someone, of course, watching us, right? Was there any promotion b beforehand <coughs> at all? Not really. Only the name on the poster. Just the name, and you know, huh? some simple like text uh, you know yeah. of the members and what the band stands for yeah and i think it was like one song maybe at the myspace back then yeah so uh the the really cool thing uh was that john d was fucking packed like half an hour before we would be on stage cool. and people couldn't get down the stairs, uh, you know. That's a good feeling. Yeah, so we actually played at the, uh, you know, at the full John D, mm. where no one could get in. Uh, we started, we got on stage by having, uh, I was really fucked up in the head back then. Uh, I chose to have as an intro uh, for going on stage, mm. Spider Pig. <laughs> choir version that sounded like you know it, it sounded like from soundtrack from a uh, from uh, the omen for example <laughs> but instead of instead of uh, having uh, you know ave satani a uh, spider pig <laughs> and i could see that people were looking at each other and was like, what the fuck is happening here you know what is this um i i guess the vibes of what the fuck is happening with what they got on stage and Nicholas, especially when it comes to his performance um, that concert, it was 
something really, really, you know, magical. Uh, was he still kind of extreme <coughs> back then with his performance? Well, the thing is that I had a really cool idea uh, in regards to what we should do on stage because I said to Nicholas at that time, you know, something I <clears throat> I, I don't think that it fits the music whenever you don't have any text just to stand there and not do anything. Mm. So I had this idea. I had a really big uh, mirror at home. So I said to Nicholas, okay, we're going to take it, place it in front of the drums. So whenever you don't have text, you can talk to yourself. So the, the, the thing is that whenever Nicholas wasn't uh, having any text, he was going in front of that mirror, started talking to himself and arguing even with himself. And uh, people were like, what the hell is happening here? Yes. And in the, in, during the last song, uh, as I said, that he was even arguing with himself. He actually punched the mirror, mm. cut the mirror into pieces yeah. and I could see the people from Inferno Festival you know stage managers and everything be like oh fucking shit what, what the hell is gonna happen now yep. so he got two big pieces of the mirror and started cutting himself there you go <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden you know you have like stage full with glass from the mirror and blood, blood shit. and uh, the inferno guys they were like oh shit he's gonna fucking throw them in someone's face and oh. you know he, he's gonna be fucking chaos luckily he didn't do that so um, but at the same time i don't think they were that happy uh, having to uh, clean it up clean it up uh, luckily right it was the last band yeah yeah exactly no one after you <laughs> exactly so I, th I think it was a really cool experience, and I, I haven't really met someone be, uh, that was in uh, Jundia that uh, day and said that, okay, uh, it wasn't cool. Uh, I think everyone really enjoyed the vibes on the, that concert. Fuck, I missed that one, man. How old were you back then? Um, I'm born in 84. Yeah. Uh, I started hanging around in Oslo in 2005, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah in the weekends because i always lived in holden you know mm. but i didn't go to that particular uh, inferno but i remember quite well when you guys came around yeah and myspace and all that shit you know i remember that because i was digging into black metal at that time you know i started work in 2004 yeah as a side thing you know so uh off, cool story fuck i damn i didn't go there you know but have you played a lot live with uh, with nicholas before he left no, not really. I think we did uh, we did uh, some concerts in Germany, and uh, we played Partisan in two thousand nine. And uh, after that, I think Niklas decided to go back to Sweden. Yeah. And uh, when he decided to go back to Sweden. Uh, he put full focus on you know making shining a big name, mm. and that's why he also decided that uh, okay, fuck it, I can't be in Den So Cult anymore, and which is quite understandable because you know when it comes to Den So Cult, uh, for for us it has been like a healing process, a healing method, mm. while shining is like a job, you know. Oh yeah, we 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 never, you know, I, I never imagined then so called or music ever as a, paying for the bread. Yeah, mm. but did he make a living <coughs> out of shining? I think he does. Okay, well that's good. I think good he does. I, I think he has come to the point that uh, the basic income comes from there. Mm -hmm. I can't be sure, of course, but. It's not the Nicholas uh, episode today, but did he move back to Harmstad or where did he live in Sweden? Um, Just curiosity. I think I think it was Elskistuna. Where's that? Elskistuna is a place uh, like uh, one hour outside uh, Stockholm. Okay, so you went to the same place the uh, where East Coast. Uh, Kent is uh, from there. Oh yeah, Tyrant and the Black. 
is from uh, Skilstuna. Ja. Ja. And now he lives in uh, in uh, in Finland. Does he? Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't mm-hmm. even know. Lives in Tampere. Okay, I, mm-hmm. I didn't even know about it. I actually, when I went to Finland, as, as I told you this summer, to uh, do a podcast with Iro, mm. I also was supposed to do a podcast with Niklas. Yeah. But the time schedules was a chaos. I did, never got to do it. I, that sucks because I've been in touch with Niklas on the phone and stuff for about a year or something now to do a podcast with him. And I, don't, I do not want to do it over the internet. Yeah. All this podcast, I want to sit down like this, mm-hmm. like you and I are doing now. I want to do one of those with Niklas. He's up for it, but we just need to work, you know. Yeah. I'm not in Finland every day, you know, and he, I suppose he's not in Norway every day either. So, no, it's been way too many years since the last time I saw Niklas. I think, uh, I think last time was 2000, 2000. When the fuck was it? 2010, I think. 2011, maybe. Well, that's 10 years back, man. Yeah. Maybe you and I should make a trip of it. Yeah, maybe and we visit should. him. Maybe, uh, maybe we should. Uh, when it comes to Tampere, I have uh, good friends, uh, Horna. Yeah. They are from uh, Tampere. Uh, it's a cool, cool place. Let's do it, man. Okay. It's a really cool place. Yeah. The, the, the only thing that uh, is weird uh, for me when it comes to Finland is that uh, in, in some way, Everything feels like a fucking Kate Bush uh, blurry video in, from the 80s. You know, the, the vibe of Finland is really, really weird. I don't want to say anything wrong, but yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's really weird. <laughs> when we went there now, we obviously landed in Helsinki and we went to Eros childhood uh, home, which was uh, Tulos. Do you okay. know where, where that is? No clue. It's just halfway in between Tampere and Helsinki, mm-hmm. so I was so close. Yeah, but they didn't have a car or anything, you know. So fuck it. Yeah, Helsinki is a yeah, really special town. I remember driving through the center, and uh, <coughs> there were there were people with bending knees in front of the pubs, eleven o'clock in the fucking morning. And I think it was marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Finland, <laughs> sue me. Oh man. Okay, let's go back to the Sorkolte then. Uh, what happened when he left? Did you did you right away find the new members? No, we had uh, we had uh, no. That's the thing with the Sorkolte is that it's a process that you don't really no stress it. Yeah, I I don't put any press on it. So uh, we released the album in two thousand. Nine, mm. it was. We played some concerts up until 2011, and uh, after that, you know, uh, there were some private things I had to uh, focus on. So we didn't really, we didn't really have any kind of rehearsals or any meetings up until 2013. Mm. And then we released the the second album from the first one with Agonia Records in 2014. Yeah. And uh, was that with uh, <coughs> Mario singing? That is uh, with uh, Einar from uh, Fortid. Oh yeah. From uh, Einar from uh, Iceland that uh, used to live in Oslo at that time. Mm-hmm. So uh, Einar was uh, the the second. Like a vocalist, yeah. Then so had, and from 2014 to uh, 2022, uh, we had to, to to put it like that. We attempted having uh, two vocalists, uh, which uh, didn't really. Those vocalists uh, didn't really fit with uh, oh. the whole idea, I guess, or the feeling uh, we would like to have. And uh, that was up to when uh, I listened uh, to a new guy, uh, Simon, uh, a quite young guy. Uh, he's the vocalist of uh, Tilinte Yurt also. And... <coughs> I knew that 
you know, he, he would actually be the the right guy for the for the job. Mm. And, um, if you're gonna listen to the new album, you're gonna see that both the clean parts, because that, that's the the key point with Den Sogal, that uh, you, you have the screaming vocals, the black metal type uh, screaming vocals, but at the same time, the few places where the the vocals are gonna be clean uh, they're quite important and mm. uh, you need to have you know the right person not only stepping on the notes but at the same time having the right feeling when expressing himself through of course. the text of course so not everyone manages this in, uh, in the best way and you even asked me yeah in uh, in regards to uh, vocals, yes. Yeah. When was this? This I think was uh, 2018 two, or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that was a big compliment, obviously. Something like that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. But I had, uh, you know, I have, I have a hard time to do several things at once. When it comes to creativity, you know. Well, you, you said uh, also earlier. Uh, I didn't really know about it. Uh, you played bass in uh, the Death Trip. Yeah, the last album. Yeah, I was just asked by uh, the. Uh, I don't know if that's a secret or not, but the Peaceville manager just asked me if I wanted to contribute with bass. And uh, no, that's cool. Of course, the, the album is fantastic. It's like a. Bursum vibe going on there. I think it's the best release from uh, the Death. Uh, to be honest, I totally agree, and uh, not being biased, but uh, yes. But uh, as I told you, I uh, I need to focus hundred percent on what I'm doing. You know, mm. Mork. You know, and th- th- that Death Trip thing was like it's okay. Play bass on this album. That's that's one thing, but start to rehearse and go and play shows. That's a different thing. You know, I don't think um, has Death Trip uh, been a live band. I don't I, think so. I, I really doubt it. I think it's a studio band only you yeah. know one band band i think i think it is right so the stuff no when it comes to then so called that's <coughs> that's also something that uh we're gonna try uh from now on that uh it's gonna be like single concerts uh no on, tours only no 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 have you been touring with the so called not only one of festivals and, and, and stuff. No, there, there was like a discussion having a tour in uh, 2000, 2009 when the album uh, was released. But um, <clears throat> I think I, I think that uh, the the idea fits more with the single shows, and you know yeah. uh, we we gonna keep it like that. Yeah, sure. But uh, regarding touring, we need to touch upon the Golgoth thing. Mm. How did you come into that situation? No, it was just a decision of uh, over through over a few beers. Uh, Are you new, the guys? They came to Oslo, or <coughs> what was the deal there? No, it was yeah, at that point. It was uh, Morten uh, from uh, Nindiger, yeah, uh, playing the guitars. Telok, yeah, playing the guitars in uh, uh, Golgoth. Uh, and uh, this was, was with Gal, right? That was with Christian, yes. Yes, so it was uh, we were having a few beers together, and uh, there, there was a situation back then with uh, Roger, mm. an internal dispute. I didn't really, you know, uh, care about to be honest. Uh, uh, they, they, in, in, the, in, in the end they split so obviously something was going on yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I was basically asked if I could you know help playing a few shows live and you know I basically saw it in the sense that okay I'm gonna play music that I like and respect and you know what's behind that is not really my business no, but you so, love Gorgoroth I suppose yeah, yeah. it's a big band for you for me it has Gorgoroth and uh, the, the whole uh, composing thinking of Gorgoroth uh, has influenced a lot. Um, you know, uh, up in, in a way, it's quite similar. You know, the build up of different layers from guitars and, um, on the riffing, it's quite similar to what Roger, for example, is doing. 
Er det da, det, det album Ad Majorem Ad Satanas uh, Was that the period you came in there? Was that the album that was current no, then? No, no, that was uh, that, that was way before, I guess uh, Because that's a fantastic <coughs> album That was uh, 2007 That would mean That would mean it's right after uh, Twilight of the Idols, I think. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. If I remember right, Twilight of the Idols was released in 2003, and there wasn't anything after. There, there wasn't anything before 2000. A bit uncertain, actually. I need to figure this out because yeah, this um, is an uh, important the, thing for me at least. <coughs> this kind of thing, so uh, you know, can cause a fucking stroke. Okay, now I'm going to be a hipster metal dude and go into the metalarchives.com. Let's <laughs> see <laughs> here. Gorgoroth. Hang on. There's three Gorgoroths, by the way. One from Finland, one from Norway, and one from the Philippines. Philippines. So now it? you know. Okay, let's see here. Discography. Uh, the one I mentioned, Ad Majorem Satanas Gloria, is the title of it, of course. It's from yeah, that, 2006. Yeah, that was that was after that album. Yep, yeah, and uh, that's, that's a fantastic album. I need to get that one on, on vinyl. Yeah, okay, but you, you met the guys over a few beers and you just were asked to step in. I uh, just played some uh, concerts playing uh, music I like and, you know, yeah? that's but, it. But did you go into rehearsals or did you just... No, nah, we had like... We had... Uh, two rehearsals. Yeah. A lot of homework. Two, two rehearsals in two days. And right after, uh, we just uh, jumped on a plane and directly to uh, Denmark for the first concert. How so, did it go? <clears throat> I think it was cool. I think it was a cool experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I guess it, it was a bit weird at times because of these internal things going on with Gorgoroth and the dispute and everything. Um, but you know, I, I didn't focus on that. I just focused on playing the music I like. Did your and, job? Yeah, and I was done with it. So, but that's the only touring you've been doing then. That that, that's the only touring. Yeah, um, that's uh, not a bad one. It's a uh, Gorgor is a big name. Uh, yeah, yeah. Suppose um, the crowds were great all over Europe. And at the same time, you know, it's uh, I'm at the age right now that uh, I can say that okay, I did what basically I wanted mm. and you know I, I don't feel like repeating it you know I'm done with it so and that's why then so Galta is not is out of the question you know having a tour because uh, I I saw that it, it was cool when it happened and you know but I'm not really keen on uh, no. this kind of life yeah it's that, hectic uh, it's not my thing it's uh, I like I like being close to my base, you know, I, I like... Sleeping in your own bed and stuff. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on tour, you don't get any sleep. You never know what kind of food you get, <laughs> um, what kind of you know, amps you uh, get. I, I'm like the person that, you know, I'm going to focus on uh, the private life a, a lot. I wouldn't, for example, like the idea of uh, not seeing my kid for yeah. uh, quite a long time. I see that. <coughs> But is, it, is there anything we have not talked about now? Stuff that you've done? Uh, I guess... Uh, Something I guess you want to bring up? <clears throat> the, the, the basic things when it comes to my life, I, I guess, is uh, the music part, which is uh, the so called and after that it's uh, uh, the, the work part that takes also for my uh, creativity, uh, Telerok. Yeah, you started a pub in yeah. Notodden. Yeah, all uh, of a sudden. Metal pub. <laughs> I wouldn't say that it's metal. Uh, I, I, I would... Rock pub then. <clears throat> well, the, the cool thing is that rock 
can get categorized uh, or can include many different categories, right? Uh, you can start from Elvis Presley and end up to, um, you know, uh, Cannibal Corpse. And Sputnik. Or in Sputnik. <laughs> for, for all that counts. Sputnik. The, the, that's the cool thing. that uh, In some ways, rock is not just the music it's you know it's the it's a lifestyle i suppose yeah it's the lifestyle it's oh. the, the the way Aesthetic. people express themselves you can be rock um, on, based only on uh, your attitude if you see my point yep and um, even fucking sputnik you know categorizes of being rock because he he was in a in a way unorthodox Mm-hmm. based on the, you know how the society in Norway was at that point and he ended up fucking selling one million cassettes through he's a rock star man <laughs> through fucking gas stations you know that is insane so uh, does he live there by here by the way he lives in uh, Drangedal in Drangedal yeah I, I knew that he, he lives in fucking Drangdal. Um, the people has, listening to this now have no idea of what we are talking about well it's actually really cool thing that we talk about Sputnik because the, there is a cool story about uh, one guy from uh, uh, one guy from uh, the old days of Inferno uh, that had posted in a forum uh, there was one guy <gasps> I heard this one, please tell it it's fantastic <laughs> there was one guy asking about uh, new bands from Norwegian the most satanic yeah, most Norwegian satanic bands Norwegian bands <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden there's a guy saying that oh you should try uh, buying CDs from Sputnik and Dead Air and he came out with some amazing stories of <laughs> Sputnik is talking about uh, talking about Satan in an ancient Norwegian uh, dialect and you know <clears throat> The guy ended up, you know, buying Sputnik uh, CDs and uh, finding out that it's some really <laughs> fucked up country-like music from fucking Telemark. You know, it's uh, it's fantastic. I, it was insane. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea was the devil's death ensemble. Ensemble. <laughs> 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 People should only have known that. With, with, with translation from the song Rai Rai, which yes. means kill, kill. Oh, <laughs> it ends in Norwegian. <laughs> it's beautiful. Oh, I love that stuff. <laughs> you had Sputnik playing in your fucking club. I had Sputnik, uh, Sputnik mm. playing at Telerock yes. because I wanted to irritate uh, the municipality. I was, uh, I, I was in a huge conflict with the municipality. <coughs> There, there was this uh, mayor uh, here in Norton that she tried to do my life miserable from day one, mm. and she kind of, uh, you know, uh, she kind of tried in her own ways to bankrupt me by closing down parts of uh, <coughs> parts of the venue, and I had said to people that. If I'm gonna fucking win through this uh, conflict, uh, just in order to irritate people, I'm gonna fucking book uh, Sputnik. And it ended up uh, having like a sold out concert with Sputnik, where 95% of the people being at the concert being metalheads. So it was a surrealistic, uh, you know, experience. Oh, fantastic. Both for me and I guess for uh, for him. I don't. I don't think he has been, yeah, in uh, in such concert before. You know, having like metal heads head banging in front of him. <laughs> fantastic. Was it easy to have uh, have him booked? Uh, I yeah, it was easy for me at least. Yeah. I, I just came in contact directly with uh, his wife, and you know, from that from that day and after, we have become uh, quite good friends. Actually, it's uh, lots of respect both uh, from my side and their side. Well, how old is he now? I believe I believe he's now uh, he he must be seventy nine. Yeah. 
uh, it's quite fucking amazing that uh, you know he still stands on yeah. on stage performing uh, live. You know, he he is the same age as the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. You know, yeah, uh, it's. <laughs> That's quite a thing, I guess. I remember him from cassette tapes growing up from my grandparents, you know. He's always been around. I have fucking cassettes of Sputnik upstairs, so you should see uh, later on. Uh, it's fucking magic. Sputnik your satanic works? Yes. <laughs> the anthology. Ah, uh, cool, man. Everyone should, uh, when visiting Notodden, the most people, I suppose, know that uh, it's one of the black metal capitals just because of Emperor, I suppose. Yeah, it, it has been like that. Yeah. And, uh, A lot of black packers coming <coughs> in. I, I would say that, you know, it, it's it's a fine combination, I guess, uh, with uh, by having the legacy from emperor and at the same time having uh, the biggest uh, staff church yeah here in Udolden. uh so i guess it's just one and a half hour you know drive from uh, oslo yeah so uh, uh, for me it's a fucking ideal place uh, to be because mm. you, you combine everything you combine you know the musical parts and you combine uh, water and mountains um you know forests a lot of forests lots of forests mm. and you know telemark in a way is uh i i would say that it's the same kind of landscape uh, from where my family comes from so uh, oh. in a way it felt you know it made the idea of being home you know at once yeah. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, and I guess I have contributed the last five years by bringing, for example, uh, Mork yeah. to Nutton to uh, perform live. First uh, time, Septic Flesh, good old friends uh, from uh, Greece. They were here in uh, August. Mm -hmm. Playing concerts, so uh, you know I, I try my best to in a way build up uh build up from the legacy of emperor yeah. from the 90s you know to to build up again uh a scene here in a uh, town because the scene had gradually died yeah the people grew up like and that. moved away and uh, uh, you it's, know. it's not only that um northern and the the municipality of Nutton they have been really fucking lousy uh, maintaining uh, the interest in uh, people you know all from I guess from 2000 until 2012 2013 all the cultural uh, you know uh, ways uh, teenagers would have in order to play music for example they were taken away from them oh yeah uh youth clubs that uh, closed down and you know the, the, there wasn't any replacement to that so it came at the same time with for example the explosion of uh, internet mm. right mm. and the explosion of video games and yeah. all of a sudden from having you know like uh teenagers uh wanted to be together making forming a band being creative making music mm. you had generation after generation of teenagers uh staying at home staying home mm. playing fucking video games yeah and i'm trying right now through Telerock to change that yeah uh the best way i can uh, i i want to have uh people getting interested again uh here in town of um you know taking a guitar find two three persons and you know forming a band and being creative again well have you have you seen any results in this i believe that uh i believe that uh it, it starts gradually i, I have teller now for five years mm -hmm. so gradually i see that the interest gets more and more and uh 
I hope for all that counts that uh, the the new generations are gonna look a bit back and you know uh, try to copy what once was. Yeah, because that's exactly what uh, what we need. Is there any bands here now? Um, I think there is uh, there is a couple of bands uh, being formed and uh, black performing. metal bands. Uh, not sure. I don't think black metal bands, but uh, rock bands and quite a lot of blues bands because it's n- most famous for the blues festival. N- Norton has Europe's uh, biggest uh, festival. Is that still going? Yeah, it, blues festival. It, it still goes, but at the same time, it's like uh, I guess it's not a theme festival anymore. It has many different types of music uh, oh, okay uh, it's become mainstream then in it, a way it, the the thing is that if you want money you know if you want to survive nowadays you need to uh, integrate uh, new elements yeah if you true. if you're gonna try to be like exclusively uh blues festival you're gonna fail yeah, they they had a quite a bit of famous names here over the years. Yeah, it's impressive been, names even. Robin Plant, uh, ZZ Top played here. Um, I think that uh, it, it's quite cool having a big festival in town. That, that's one thing. And the other thing is that you know by when blues festival became big here in Norway, you know we didn't really have many festivals. Right now, Norway has shitloads of festivals. Yeah, that's true. Every year. Yep. So th- there is competition to that as well. And, uh, you know, if you don't integrate uh, new elements, then you're gone. Yeah. You know, you, you become you, this niche thing, which is, which is great in ways, you know, but I don't know, people will lose interest in after a while. I suppose. Um, right now, they have integrated uh, <coughs> rock bands and they have even fucking country, I think, uh, seen. You know, country is big over here. <coughs> and unfortunately, mm. I never really fucking understood why the hell country music, uh, especially when it comes to telemark, uh, would be big. But you know, uh, that's works you, for people. I guess if, if you visit a, <coughs> a, a a gas station today, the only music they have in racks there is basically country CDs. You know, yeah. I see, I think they still have them. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's like I'm truck stop music, sure. you know. I, I don't really, I don't really pay focus on. Uh, Heidi Hugo's greatest uh, hits and yeah. stuff. <laughs> you know, it's uh, the. I guess for many people, it doesn't really fucking make sense. You know, it doesn't make sense. Oh. Yeah, you have, for example, um, I don't think there is any person from Italy or Spain or, you know, Mexico that would come to Norway and expect, for example, that there is a country festival in Sellivur. Yeah, and Winstra. You know. uh, yeah, yeah. But there is, for some weird reason. Uh, country so. is huge. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know why, but yeah. You want to make money, uh, Mika? We should get into country. I think I'll uh, <laughs> skip that. <laughs> I think I'll skip that. <laughs> Okay, man, I think we reached the end of the line. Oh, that was cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the story. Uh, thank you for uh, visiting. Yeah. Was our, uh, you need to come to Holden soon. And we should... Uh, we should uh, do that. Yeah. And we, uh, I should uh, make Ida do some dinner next time. <laughs> or, uh, nah, we, we have agreed uh, we're going to visit this uh, seafood uh, yes. place. Yep. Reke Cafe a reiki cafe, yeah. Yes, you know, absolutely. That uh, that is something uh, to to be done. And the next time, you know, you, you're a bit unlucky because there is a place here in uh, Norton where I'm uh, ordering uh, octopus. Oh. Or as Norwegians like to call it, black sprit. Yes, squid. <clears throat> yeah, but that's the whole fucking point. It's not the squid. <laughs> <laughs> It's a fucking octopus. It's a different thing. Okay, but, okay. but Norwegians, for one weird reason, you know, they categorize everything as black sprit and you know, squid is squid. It's a head with several arms. Octopus. What do you want, man? Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah. So I'm ordering from that place uh, octopus. So next time you're here, we uh, we're gonna cook that. Uh, you're 
a bit unlucky right now because the place is closed. I never tasted it, so I'm looking forward to that. Ah, it's a fucking cool food. Oh, cool. Everyone should visit Tellerock when uh, black packing in uh, Notodden. It's the only, seems like you're the last man standing. We went out last night, it was a Friday. Not a single pub or restaurant was open. Only Tellerock. Unfortunately, you know, uh, we, we kind of jumped from one crisis to a new crisis. Yeah, we, from a pandemic to an economic <coughs> crisis. We, we, we jumped from, you know, not being allowed to go out uh, reality mm. uh, to, uh, okay, you can go out, but at the same time... You can't not, afford it. <laughs> and not have any money about it. That's insane. So uh, I really hope that uh, the whole thing is going to turn because, uh, you know, I'm still standing and, you know, uh, I think that based on how I do things, I'm going to find a way to still stand. Mm. But uh, I, I guess there are many other uh, entities, uh, companies that, you know, had, for example, uh, debt from before. Mm. And when you have debt from before and you jump from one crisis to the other, you know, it doesn't take long that uh, you're fucked. Uh, you're fucked. So I really hope that the whole thing is going to turn over. I suppose it will uh, in time. And uh, another thing, I listened to the entire new album last night mm -hmm. from Den Såkalte. I suppose you can't reveal any uh, details about that no, yet. The, the, the title is already announced. Pesten uh, som tar over mm. is the title of the album. And uh, it's going to be hopefully released uh, by Goni Records uh, April, May 2000, Next year. 2023. Yeah. So I hope so at least. Fantastic you, album. You never know. Really fresh, good sounding. I, I wouldn't say fresh because it's quite. Um, I, I guess the album has uh, elements from uh, elements from the th bands I like uh, most. It's quite. It's quite an old fashioned. Yeah, but it sounds uh, like fresh than so called. I, there's a red uh, thread <coughs> here, which is then so called. Yeah. I can hear it's you making the riffs. Yeah, the, that's quite distinct. Yeah. I, I guess through you the have years. your sound, man. That, that's quite distinct. But I think it's also the first time uh, where maybe the Bathory Hammerheart uh, oh, yeah. Twilight of the Gods. Yeah, when you say so, yeah, it was a bit melodic in that vein element mm. uh, came into yep. so um, well, it's going to be cool to see how people are going to react to it and the, the new, new vocalist is fantastic sounding oh, Simon did a really good job I'm uh, impressed absolutely You. it's a good thing that I didn't join <laughs> 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 oh, very good <clears throat> ok man checking out cheers see ya For information regarding Mörk concert bookings, merchandising and other matters, please visit the official webpage www.mörkisebakke.no. You can find the link in the description of this podcast episode. Thanks.